I had the opportunity to to see the death process pretty close. Many people that I worked on, because I was on an emergency response team in the hospital, many of those patients died as a result of their injuries. But I just felt... I just felt like there was something that wasn't always being fulfilled in those situations. I can recall several instances of medical professionals notifying a family member that that family member had passed or died. It was kind of left at that. That's kind of all they had to say. Warning. The podcast you're about to listen to may contain graphic descriptions of violent assaults, murder, and adult language. Listener discretion is advised. The Role of Coroner with Jessamine County, Kentucky Coroner Michael Hughes, Part 1 of 2. Welcome to the Murder Police Podcast. I am Wendy. And I'm David. Well, Wendy, we just completed a fantastic interview with three amazing people. I'm excited to get this out. I fell in love with it the entire time I started to put it together and post. Why don't you tell the listeners what they're about to hear in this two-part series? Well, in this series, we're going to go over what involves the role of a coroner. And I'll tell you, I was really amazed at what this job entails. I had no idea. Likewise, I'd worked with coroners and deputy coroners for several years at the police department when I was in the homicide unit and had an understanding, a practical understanding of what it was like as far as their duties go. But in this interview, Michael Hughes, who's the coroner in Jessamine County, Kentucky, really opened my eyes to a lot of intricacies that I wasn't aware of. Yeah, me either. I guess most people probably like us thought, not to be disrespectful, but You think that the role of a coroner is just to come pick up the deceased person. Really, that's all I thought it was. I learned it's so much more than that. The fact that they really own that crime scene before anybody else does. I had no idea of that. Yeah, Exactly. The other things, too, is that we get the audience to hear is some of the technical things like what are the qualifications required to be a Kentucky coroner and how do you get into the coroner's office? That's an interesting thing, too. The guest, uh, we also, of course, had not only Michael Hughes, but his wonderful wife, Olivia Hughes, who is a volunteer in his office, which is what we're going to hear, too. This is like a partnership that I've never heard of before. And then, of course, then we had Cassie Robinson, who is one of his handful of deputy coroners. And together, they talked about the training and the certifications that they have to complete, the importance of relationships, both in the coroner's office and outside of the office. Their general duties and responsibilities, and I think that's what you were alluding to, was those things that I never knew that they did. And then I think, and this will speak to you too, is probably the most unique thing, is the aftercare that they provide for families and friends of deceased people in the wake of this death and how long that extends. And there's even a, a really neat story of a family unification that would have never occurred if the deputy coroner, Cassie Robinson, wasn't pursuing assisting the family so much. And we'll leave that up to the listeners to hear that. Yeah. And one final thing I'd like to add, if listeners have not heard the podcast we did on the murder of my best friend, Angela Wooldridge, that's how I came to know Michael and Cassie and Olivia. You know, you just said how they stick by your side after the death of someone, and they really do. I just hope that our listeners tune in, hear what these corners and deputy corners and uh, Michael's wife put into this job, and it, it really is their heart and soul. Welcome to the Murder Police Podcast. Today we have with us the Jessamine County Coroner's Office. That's out of Nicholasville, Kentucky. Mr. Michael Hughes, thank you for joining us. How are you today, sir? I'm very good. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, sir. Thank you for coming. With us also, we have Miss Olivia Hughes, Michael's wife. How are you, Miss Olivia? I'm fine. Thank you. And we have Cassie Robinson, Deputy Coroner with Jespin County Coroner's Office. Miss Cassie, how are you? I'm great, thanks. And David. 
you're here again. How are you? Yeah, I'm a perennial favorite, I guess. I'm doing fine. And I'm excited to hear these people tell everybody what it's like to be a coroner. Well, with that, let's begin. Michael, again, thank you for coming. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your role in this Jessamine County Coroner's Office. Well, thank you for asking. I was elected to cor- this coroner's office for the first time in uh, 2010, and I've been repeatedly reelected each time. And each uh, term is for four years. So this means I'm on my 12th year right now. Well, that's awesome. You have obviously a lot of experience, and and I know you're an icon around here. Olivia, I know also you have a large role in this department as well. I've had contact with you myself not too, too long ago over, over an incident involving my best friend, and you were you were the first person that I talked to, and you were exceptional and very welcoming and warming in speaking to me. So why don't you tell me, aside of taking those intake calls and calling back friends, families, whatever, tell the listeners what else your role is and what you do there with coroner's office. Well, my role has always been a volunteer for the office, and I encompass just about everything that the coroner does, the deputy coroners do, and administrative work. I think the thing that God really led me to is actually speaking to the families and the decedents, loved ones, after that they're, have, they've passed away. And I feel like I have made a lot of friends in doing this role. Well, again, I know you were certainly a, a, a warm welcome for me when when I was going through what I was going through, not really knowing which end was up. And you you really helped to guide guide that in a a great direction. So thank you for being there for me. Cassie, I can't leave you out. I didn't get to talk to Michael, but you you were exceptional. And you and I have spent literally hours on the phone talking. And with your role, I'm assuming as a deputy coroner, and correct me if I'm wrong, you assist Michael, but if Michael's not available, then you assume his role. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. So I'm guessing In your role, you also receive the same training for, what is that, Department of Criminal Justice? Yes, we receive the same training through the DOCJT. So you have the same role as Hillman that you go on to the crime scene and you you do investigate that scene and you determine a cause of death, I'm assuming. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And it is an investigation. We have to investigate to figure out what. What, where, how, why, Mm -hmm. who. Very, very neat. So you both, all of you have really, really great roles in what you do. I've, I don't know how each of you do it. It's, it's, um, I commend you for what you do. I certainly couldn't, but you know, I know behind the scenes you, you do your professional role, I should say, but I think it's, it's notable that you all reach out and spend the time that you do with families and friends because, you know, people want answers especially people like me, you know, I I'm, I'm love details. And I want, as you recall on the phone, when you and I've spent, I want every detail and I want to start from the very beginning. And I don't want you to leave out one thing. And if you do, I backtrack and I get you right back there. So thank you all for doing that and being there for people. I, I don't, I don't know how you do what you do, but I'm grateful that, that you all do it for, for Jessamine County here. Now, Michael, I'm assuming is Cassie your only deputy or Cassie, does he work you like the only deputy or do you all have more? We have a whole team. It's not just me. We have a whole team that's... We actually have three deputies. And the reason we have that many is often cases require the presence of two of us. We're very fortunate in Jessamine County to have the assistance of the fire department when we need lift assists because of an extremely large decedent. And of course, we work hand in hand with law enforcement and emergency medical personnel. In the city, that's Nicholasville Police Department or Wilmore Police Department. And in the county, it's Jessamine County Coroner's Office. But uh, the other reason we have three deputies is so that we could fairly rotate the schedule so nobody has an excessively large amount of call days. And when we do call, our deputies don't have to remain in the office. They can go about their lives, whatever they want to do, and they stay in contact by telephone with our central dispatch. 
office. Who are the other deputies? Let's. Uh, what are their names so we can get them on the record? I think people wouldn't be interested to know. Well, other than Cassie, we have Stephanie Manley and Paul Warner. Gotcha. And, of course, they've had the same training through Department DOCJT, correct? Yes, absolutely. So uh, tell me a, a little bit, too, about when you said call days. What, what's And Cassie, jump in here, too. What's that look like? Because, like you said, they don't have to be in the office. They can be bouncing around in their, in their, in their normal life. What, what's a typical period look like when somebody's on call? Well, I think I'm going to let Cassie answer that because she's on call more than I am. I, I make myself available to all the deputies every single day that I possibly can. And I therefore don't take a routine call pattern. I feel that it's more appropriate for me to make sure that what they're doing is what we need to have done and to follow up with them. But I also try to get involved in a situation where we have a special type of a case, such as an infant death, that requires a a bit more investigation. That's not to say that my deputies can't do that. But at that point, I go there to assist them. That makes sense. Back in the business, we call those red balls, the the ones that we're going to need more attention and need and everything. And I think if I'm tracking you right, I, I like the way you do that because the problem, too, that if the boss is there all the time, people don't learn. That's probably a really good way. And plus, let's all be honest, most of us don't want the boss breathing down our neck when we work. And I'm not saying that goes on with you all, but I think we're all human beings when it comes to that. Well, I, I have to agree with that. I'd like to throw a plug in for all my deputies because we have such a camaraderie between them that they work together so well. And I've never experienced this before in this office, but of these three deputies, they're all willing to help each other, even if they're not on call. They'll make themselves available to go with the one that is on call. And that's almost just unheard of for people to want to do that, to want to do that, take on that extra workload. But they're all so involved and interested in what we do. And they've seen the results of being there for families, the way they can bless families with their conversation, with their prayer, with answered questions. I think you found out that even with Cassie, she stayed in touch by telephone with Wendy. And and that's just, that's nothing really different for Cassie. It's just kind of typical for the way we operate. That takes service to a whole different level, right? Had servant leadership for sure, and that's, that's commendable. Absolutely, thank you for recognizing that. Because that that's the you know the the whole thing when people have a loss is just a, a dark avenue, and we've discussed it on this podcast many times through the the role of victim advocacy when you represent surviving victims, especially in violent crime, but in any kind of death, you know the confusion that sets in, and the idea that they need somebody to walk them through that. That's that's excellent work, and. I'll compliment you on this, too. What you're describing is an excellent team, and teams just don't happen. Teams are made up of people that have a strong why, the same goals and objectives, and and the leadership that lets them form into a team. So I I agree. You don't see good teams everywhere you go. That's true. In my career, I I can count them on less than all the fingers on one hand, and I always tell people when you're in a good team environment, eat it up and enjoy it because you don't know when you're going to get it again. But it does make work fun. Cassie, does it make it more enjoyable? Absolutely. And I also think that we have a good team, too, because Michael's been a great leader when you were talking about not having your boss breathing down your neck and giving you room to grow and learn. That's exactly what Michael did. I mean, I learned the foundation of an investigation. And then when it was time to kind of get out of the nest, he would just say, go ahead, you know, go on your own. You've got it. And then but he's always there, even to this day. If I have a question, it could be something really trivial. He'll listen and give me a, a very educated answer. And he'll, he's built my confidence through this whole process as the years go by. And I think that's because he's let us just kind of get out and learn and figure it out. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, that's important things. Well, and let me run too when we're talking about the team because Olivia. Make sure, I, I don't know if we really glazed over this or not, or if the audience is really clear on the idea that Michael and Olivia are married. Did we really cover that in the beginning? or did I... Well, I did say his wife, but okay. we didn't get into that. Yeah. And I know where you're going. I'm wondering the same. How is it to be married to to Michael, to a coroner that has a job like this? Is that what you're wondering? Yeah, and also it, in as far as the team, because I, when we, during the intros, I didn't know you volunteered. 
I thought you were, which I was like blown away with. I think it's a neat thing. You definitely are part of that team too. So tell us a little bit about what it's like to be married that somebody has a job like this that with the weight that comes with it. And then more so, I'd, I'd like to learn more about how you are, how you partner with that so well and get so deeply involved. Well, we partner so well because since we've been married, we've always been a team in each corporation or business that we've operated. And the first one being we were on call 24-7, just much like the coroner's office, 365 days a year. And we had to be a team together in order to run that smoothly and effectively and be available for those living patients that we were responsible for. As he journeyed into the coroner's office, there really wasn't much difference in our time spent away from each other because I became part of that team as a volunteer, assisting Michael in whatever realm that he needed assistance in. And having spending so much years together in other businesses, we both could almost tell you what the other piece, person's thinking or going to say next. And being available 24-7 is very a difficult situation for all of us, not just me and Michael, but the other deputies, because you get up at three o'clock in the morning and take a call, and then you finish that death call, and then you go on to your other job that you have to be in, in at maybe nine o'clock in the morning or, or whatever time. But Michael and I um, have just tried to smooth things out the best we can and play off of each other, and I think that's what has made it work so well. I think what she's just described to you is the fact that she's smarter and brighter than I am, <laughs> and everything I get into would probably fail if I didn't have her standing there backing me up and showing me the right way to go. Well, speaking of that past career, why don't you share a little bit about that? You, you said you all did this, whatever this job is, also full-time. What was that job? We owned Lane Medical Incorporated, which was a durable medical equipment company. Our main focus was on oxygen patients that we supplied in patients' homes via a doctor's prescription. And with putting that oxygen unit in a person's home, we also had to make sure that they had a backup system in case there was a power failure or a malfunction of the machine. And it was our job in the middle of the night if someone called and said their power was down or the machine was malfunctioned that we had to get up and go out to their home and do the repair or reteach them how to use the backup system for their oxygen. So we did that for about 25 years and are still doing that same 24-7, 365 days a year, which a lot of people don't understand. You miss a lot of holidays. You'll miss a lot of vacations. You miss a lot of those special things in your family's lives because when you're on call, duty calls. Not only do you miss those things, Olivia, but the weight you pack. Because again, in, in the business you're in, is you're not there because everything's going terrific. As I remember I had somebody in training say that one time, the same thing with police. You're not going to somebody's house because, I still remember Billy Fryer said this, you're not going to somebody's house because their kid had a birthday. You just went to their house because they woke up and the child was dead. You're missing those things, and, and I've lived that for a long time. I, I can tell you now, I really don't miss it. And the 15th of the month club is a wonderful place to be as a retiree. But it's not just that. It's it's the emotional burden that comes with that and carrying that there. It, it, that's a big deal. Absolutely. You just, your, your brain is constantly thinking, when is the phone going to ring? And you have to be prepared to go. You know, you can't spend 40 or 50 minutes and and say, I'll be there when I get there. You have to just pick up and go. Exactly. It's much more than just moving people around, and, and even more than the investigation that uh, Cassie talked about of dotting those I's and crossing those T's. Is, and, and that's what we'll continue to talk more about, too, is how you all minister to those people that are left behind and actually kind of take them through that, that dark period as best you can, which is good stuff. That business that she was talking about was more or less a, a mom and pop operation. We would have a, a couple of young people work with us to help us make some deliveries. But uh, on the other hand, most of those calls, the emergency calls were done by us. So it really was being on that call 
situation or system for us 24-7. And I'd like to throw in, because it's, I know it's going to be a question you're going to be curious about, that probably was the biggest preparation that my wife had for the coroner's office because she learned compassion, how, how to express her compassion and sympathy and understanding and sharing and love for people because we had to do the same thing. We would get to know our patients so well because we went into their home every month to check on their oxygen equipment. And we would have dinner with some of them, and we would just sit on the porch and talk. And so many times we had to uh, attend funerals for those very people that we got to know, which is very similar to what we do in the coroner's office. So that was a preparation in and of itself in dealing with the sorrow and the whether it's grief or just despair of not knowing what to do and being able to be there to answer those questions for people when they don't know what to do next. Good point. Sometimes we're preparing ourselves for things we don't know where we're preparing ourselves for, and then it pays off. What, that's providence for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's let's shift a little bit, uh, if this okay, where, we, where we're going next is you talked about doing that. Starting with Michael, when did you decide that, hey, I, I want to be a a county coroner, and what, was there something that moved you in that direction? And then, what did you start doing to uh, to get ready to run for that office? Because that's something we're going to cover too. Is that we've talked about that before? Then Kentucky coroners are elected. One of the reasons I'm, I'm I'm really pleased to do the podcast with you is an election is upon us, and we'll talk about that more through the show. And that you're running for re-election again, and this is a good opportunity to hear more about you and your family and your staff, your your fantastic staff. What moved you? to become a coroner? It, 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 was it one thing or several? I think it was a culmination of a growth process from my medical experience, which, which began in the United States Navy, where I was a hospital corpsman, was the name for a medic in the Navy. And we also provided uh, service to the Marine Corps because, as most people know, the Marine Corps is a branch of the Navy. So that's how I ended up being attached to two different branches. But throughout that, I got to serve and work with and help heal and treat veterans who were wounded in Vietnam. Some of them were my friends, people that I actually went to hospital corps school with, and they got sent to Vietnam. I didn't, fortunately, but I was there for quite a few of them when they returned, uh, Great Lakes Naval Hospital and several other places. I had the opportunity to to see the death process pretty close. Many people that I worked on, because I was on an emergency response team in the hospital, many of those patients died as a result of their injuries. But I just felt I just felt like there was something that wasn't always being fulfilled in those situations. I can recall several instances of medical professionals notifying a family member that uh, that family member had passed or died. It was kind of left at that. That's kind of all they had to say. Well, he didn't make it. Or, sorry, we did everything we could do. Or, there was nothing else we could do. Sorry. Sorry for your loss. And then sort of disappear. And I remember being able to look in people's eyes, people's faces that were Some would cry, some wouldn't because they were in shock. But it was always a feeling to me that they were looking around saying, what comes next? What do I do next? What am I supposed to do? I've never been in this situation before, especially a young, brand new widow. And it's like I wasn't in a position at that time as a corpsman to approach that person. That was the doctor's, quote unquote, role to do that. And I thought, there's got to be a better way. Surely everybody isn't just dropping this like this and letting these people flounder around. I just felt if I ever have an opportunity to be on the other side of that and do it the right way, I just felt I have an inherent ability to do it the right way. Nobody trained me. Nobody taught me what I need to do or say or put an arm around somebody or give them the biggest hug I've ever given anybody. It's just, it was there. 
And I really wanted to exercise that desire and ability. So I got to know several coroners in my hometown in Ohio, even in Kentucky, became friends with them, and I started to learn about the coroner role. And the first thing I learned is how unlike it is CSI and the, the shows, uh, Quincy and the shows we see on TV, uh, where you don't see very much of the part that I was talking about. When I realized that, hey, I qualified to be a coroner, and I found out the way that you do it is you run for the office. And that's exactly what I did. And I won on my first time out, and I've won uh, the succeeding two times, and I'm hoping to win this time. We are too. And Olivia, when this, this big life change, right, what was your impression when, when the idea came up and moving? Uh, How did you feel about going in that direction? As always, in any endeavor that Michael wanted to pursue, I was 100% on board with him because I felt like it was a passion that he wanted to do and working alongside with him with, as, with patients in the ER or whatever realm we worked with patients. I felt that same sense of I could reach out to these people just by giving them a hug, a smile, telling them it's going to get better and they're going to pull through surgery. And when he asked about us discussing the coroner role, it was 100%. Let's go. I have to I have to say though that I'm not trying to um uh how can I say take advantage of the situation or whatever for being a Christian, but we include prayer in everything we do. And we did pray pretty hot and heavy about it because we both asked ourselves, is this really something we want to do? And I just I felt yes, just based on those uh situations that I described to you before, if it just makes a difference in a handful of people's lives, that's a handful of people. We followed God's will there, and we like to think we're still doing that. It Truly, it sounds every bit like a calling to me when it speaks to you as a vocation and a benediction that way. It, it truly is. Well, Cassie, uh, what are the things about uh, the corner work that drew you to it? Well, actually, a lot of what Michael just talked about kind of rings true to me because I experienced it firsthand. I lost my husband in a car accident 11 years ago. It was out of state, and I just got a phone call from um, a corner in another state. And it was kind of this cold, just simple conversation. And there wasn't a, I, I think Michael may have just taken office, but I, someone from my husband's work came to my house. But then they left, and that was just kind of like, okay, well, here you go. And you're lost in this kind of weird space where you don't know what direction, you don't know what to do. I've never thought about a funeral home ever. So that plays a huge role in how I deal with or work with families now, because I think it's a really important time, which funeral directors do a wonderful job once you establish a funeral home. But there's this really weird kind of interim where you're not even thinking about that. You're just kind of lost. And so I like to I always tell them I'm, I'm yours until you don't need me. So any questions you have, whether it's who's going to feed my dog or who's going to meet surf pro to come clean my house. Or I just feel like you need somebody to kind of hold your hand through that process until you get your feet underneath you and let it sink in what just happened. I will have to say, I recall when my best friend passed, Olivia called me and said, Cassie drove by and saw cats outside and she's wondering if all of her cats are in. And I just thought that was so sweet that you drove by and instantly thought, Who's taking care of these cats? Yeah, I wanted to make sure everything was still secure in the house because, you know, after something terrible like that happens, a, a property will just sit and I just want to make sure. And I saw this little cat just pawing at the door and trying to get in and I was so worried. That was just so sweet of you all for you to reach out to Olivia and Olivia to reach out to me. And, yeah. you know, most people don't think of that. And for you to drive by and think about it, I think it says so much for our not just our little hometown and that hometown feel, but for you all as an agency to think so much about the people you serve as something as small as a cat, let alone the people. Yeah. And I think that's why we make such a good team because Michael and Olivia were called to do that. They innately just had that in them to do that. And then I think mine comes from experiencing it firsthand in a situation where it didn't really go 
the way I would have liked it to go. And then I had an opportunity to make it different for other people. That combined with all of our team working hard together, I feel like we cover every aspect of the grieving process, the initial shock of the grieving process to make it as less scary as possible, as least scary as possible. I like to believe that living in Jessamine County and serving the community here, this size of a community, with the diversity that we do have and, and the uh, just just the people that are here, there's love here, and it's the right size place for me to be to be doing this. I wouldn't want to be doing it in a city like Lexington. Don't disparage Lexington at all. I love the city, but I, fi- I believe that it would be so much more difficult to have that personal touch there than here, and only because there's so much happening there. They have so many cases ongoing constantly to be able to stay up with everybody and every situation that you have an active case on would be extremely difficult. So this just seems to be a great match, not only for Olivia and I, but for our entire team. Well, and I think also it, it shows in your work. It's, you know, it truly shows in your, your, the way you reach out to the community and you know, and it goes without saying, that's likely why you've been elected for as many terms as you have. The community realizes what a good team that we have here. And, you know, I don't know if there's other people running or not. I, I, I don't know. But I certainly think, you know, for this upcoming election, people need to certainly reflect on the great things that your team has brought to our community when they're looking into who am I going to elect? I, I don't know. Maybe people don't even think that. But you know, I know that my experience was was really just top notch with you all, and I had never talked to a coroner. And just the fact that you all spent as much time reaching out to me and calling me, and Cassie, bless your heart, your phone died once, and we had to resume the call, and your dog wanted to go out, and your kid was calling, and I'm like, I'm mine too. And so, I mean, I just don't, and nothing against other departments, but for that one-on-one for you all to reach out to people, that just really says a lot. And I think that's why our our little town of Nicholasville, Kentucky, loves having Michael Hughes and his team as as our coroner. Well, I can't thank you enough for, for saying that. That recognition is, we don't feel like it's well-deserved because we don't feel like heroes or doing anything, that we're doing anything extra. We actually, my personal feeling is if I didn't do the things that I do, that I would be walking away from the job unfinished. And I feel that uh, the people that are that are working with me feel the same way. I, I hope that I could say, well, I can say, I hope that, I be, that, 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 that they believe that we've made a difference in their lives as far as how to do this. Sorry to get tongue-tied there, but... Let's go, go back into the, the mechanics of this a little bit. When you, when you get elected, and we talked in the beginning about the training everybody's had, the listeners might remember when we interviewed Dr. Greg Davis on forensic pathology. Greg was really clear to talk about the idea that one of the reasons he came back to this this Kentucky itself and this area to practice his trade was because of the respect he had for the coroner system. And because of the training and the quality of the people that are here, he preferred that. The relationships that he had when he was a medical examiner were, were much better than other places he worked. And the training obviously played a big deal on that. What's an overview of the kind of training that a coroner in Kentucky completes at Department of Criminal Justice Training? What does that look like? Just an overview of some of the topics and things like that, or how much time is spent at it? Well, they, they, they always have a variety of, of training topics. Every year, there is a repeat of most of them so that new coroners and new deputies can get the same training, but they try to add something new every year. The mandatory requirement for annual coroner training is 18 hours, and that usually consists of at least one two-day seminar per year. And they also have a coroner's conference annually that that, uh, completes that same role, uh, satisfies the same number of hours. Our initial training is simply a 40-hour course which lasts for five days, to teach us the basic, and I do mean basic, ins and outs of the, of the way an office works, 
the way a coroner works, the way a deputy works. The KRSs or Kentucky Revised Statutes that apply to coroners, responsibilities and rights. The basics of forensic science. It is basic. It's I feel it's woefully inadequate, simply not, not anybody's fault. The Kentucky Coroners Association does a great job in providing this for us, but it, it's, it's a minimum stepping stone to get into the field. Then it's how much you push yourself to get the additional training that you need or how much the coroner will push the deputies to get additional training. Um, it never seems to be quite enough to me to take the minimum. I've never been satisfied since I've been the coroner of taking merely one course a year to satisfy the hours requirements. As a matter of fact, one of our lead instructors was referring to me as at one time as a perpetual student because he would see me show up for every course they had. I've accumulated over 650 hours of continuing education since I've been in the office. Um, so we like to think that the subjects that are covered are all appropriate in one way or another. I'd like to mention, as a matter of fact, that a constitutionally elected coroner is also a constitutionally elected peace officer. That means we have all the rights and privileges of any law enforcement officer in our state. As a result of that, we are able to do what's necessary, and that's why the, rule, the rules were set up as they are so that we could obtain whatever information we might need in the process of investigating a death. That means being able to demand medical records from hospitals, doctor's offices, pharmacies, clinics, whoever it might be, so that we can get into that without having to get search warrants and that sort of thing just for that basic information. Again, most of that was set up so that the system could help us find out what we need to do. The system Greg was so pleased with is not a system where the medical examiner employs an individual to be a coroner. It's where the coroners literally, hate to say run the show, but we are our own boss, other than the people who elect us, of course. But whenever we feel that we need an autopsy, we are the ones who send the individual, the, the decedent, to the medical examiner's office and tell them that we want them to do an autopsy. And they in turn do that. So their purpose was fulfilled through the Kentucky Revised Statutes as being available to assist the coroner in determining manner and cause of death. And we have worked so perfectly in harmony with the medical examiners in obtaining this. They're more than happy to work with us, to train us, to add to what we already know, which is scant compared to what they know as uh, fully trained um, forensic pathologists. But working together, we get the job done. We can understand the language that we each use. We follow the same protocols so that there's no wondering what we were doing and what what they wanted, as they say, were their eyes and ears in the field. Yeah, Ed, I'm glad you pointed out the peace officer thing. A lot of people aren't aware of that. And Wendy had alluded to the investigative roles on this, and I've probably pointed out in some other shows that in Kentucky at a death scene, the coroner is the lead law enforcement entity at that scene. They they control it. They have every bit of control. Externally, when I worked in Lexington, it didn't look like that because, you know, you, you have a scene, it's regarded as suspicious, a crime lab pulls up, people bail out of vehicles like circus clowns, the cops do, and they're all over the scene. The reality of it, though, is that there's a relationship with that county coroner where you're invited in, either explicitly on that event or there's an agreement. But I always reminded people that that's not the police department scene, is there's a coordinated effort on that. and. And yes, like Cassie said, is that most of the investigations are completed by the coroner's office. The only time law enforcement's brought in is when it's going to be overwhelming or get to the idea that we may be going to grand juries and trials and things like that. And I feel like, too, in Nicholasville, we've got a really good relationship with NPD and the sheriff's office. We work together 
they ask us questions. We ask them questions. We have an open dialogue and open line of communication, which makes it a, a pleasant scene to work on because we all can just work as a really big team. We're equally uh, as closely involved with Wilmore Police Department. That's right. And, uh, you know, if I could add to that a little bit more specifically, I find that I don't like to elaborate too much on that because it's kind of like watching the old TV show where the FBI came, comes in and tells the cops back off and the cops hate the FBI and the FBI seems to hate the cops, at least in the movies. I've always been a person that believes that I can get more accomplished with sugar than I can vinegar. So one of the things I've tried to do is develop a stronger rapport than the coroner's office has ever had in the past with our law enforcement officials. With the EMS as well, one of the best things we can do for them is to show up on time so they, in a timely manner so they don't have to uh, be sitting around waiting. But with the uh, law enforcement I've had several police chiefs say, hey, this is your scene, I'm backing off. And I just didn't like the sounds of that. And I said, well, no, I don't agree with that completely. This is our scene. This is a team effort. The scene is yours. The decedent is mine. That's the best way I felt about it so that I could, in a cheerful way, if, you can, if I can use that term, express what the, the rules are in the KRS, such as when the coroner's, until the coroner is present, no one shall move the body, no one shall take anything from the body, change positions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we've had a, a few growing experiences with that in trying to remind certain police departments if you don't have to, don't touch the weapon if we think it's a suicide, for example, because that kind of taints our, our view of the scene. Which hand was the weapon in? Where, where was the weapon positioned? How far from the body or was it on the body or whatever? So we've worked with the police departments and, and the sheriff's office to develop that rapport and sometimes people who have done things another way for so many years are resistant to change, you know that. And uh, I, th I like to think that we've made significant improvements along that line. It's not perfect yet, but I think sometimes that if the police academies would get more involved in the role of a coroner on scene, and what their responsibilities are, that would help us tremendously. And, and I don't know what, whether that is or not, but I've asked numerous officers how much time they, they, they receive training on coroners, and they look at each other and say, I don't remember any. And that's, that bothers me a little bit, so I'm, I'm always hopeful that we'll see a change in that. Yeah, I, I think it's a passed down I don't know when I came through and I had 28 years on, it's a, it's a passed down knowledge and through experience, but I don't ever remember in the academy getting anything like that. And it is about relationships because I never saw a uh, antagonistic relationship in my career at all. It was always a, probably one of the neatest things to watch is just the coordinated effort of nobody had a head in the game. And it, it was, it was actually in my experience, it was good. It, but I understand what you're talking about on those miscommunications or non understandings because typically for police, it's it, the the antagonism has never been with the coroner. It's always been the fire department, right? Those that what they call them the evidence destruction unit and stuff like that. And and most of that is even based on mythology. You know the 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 things that are passed down in our record. And it was funny because when you were talking, Cassie got really animated <laughs> when you were talking about moving guns and stuff like that, and we. We, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking back of myself, just some of the strange things I've seen at scenes, and we don't have to dig in because it could embarrass people, on things that were relocated when they didn't need to be, and, and I'll leave it at that. Yeah, it, <laughs> well, you know, it, it, anything from, um, it, and, and again, when I investigated cases, I, I was like you, and I was, I was like Cassie. You don't want anything messed with. You know, me medical treatment's a whole different ball of wax. You can deal, I can argue that, but. I just remember having conversations with people about 
really have to put a sheet over them. They're they're in their home. We're okay. You know, there's nobody traipsing through here and and whatever. It, 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 I bet it was funny. I was cracking up watching Cassie, and the any audience can't hear, but she was extremely animated <laughs> when you were talking. And I'm thinking, you know what? We probably got some war stories. Mm-hmm. We probably got a few stories to tell. Absolutely, that'd be for another day, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. But it. But it does come down to relationships. And you made a good point, too, that and I've, I've always been big on this, that TV and movies really give the public a bad representation of what every bit of this looks like. Even the shows we grew up with, you talked about, none of them are accurate. And, and that's why we like doing this podcast and taking people, especially right now, having coroners and, and deputy coroner and a deputy coroner in a room. It is so different than what TV and movies. And I think. Unfortunately, when people have a loss, that unexpected loss, they they revert back to what they think they've seen on TV. And there's part of the confusion again. But it's nothing like none of this. This whole world that all of us have worked in or are working in is nothing like what we see in TV. Well, I did want to ask, and maybe some people wonder, like I wonder, because if you not ever have had dealt with a corner, you you know what the role is because you hear TV tells you what it is. But how does it happen from the beginning? And I, it, anybody who listens to this podcast, I always want to know from the very beginning what happened. Are you all notified of a death or how How do you all know where to go? And then what do you do next? And what do you do next? Well, if I can interject on this, and Cassie, you can add to it, please. Our dispatch system is in touch with all first responders, and I like to consider us last responders, but they still consider us the first responder. They're the center where all 911 phone calls come into. Based on the information that they get from whoever calls it in, which was mainly the address of the incident that's occurred, they will dispatch law enforcement But they'll also notify in the case of a potential death or a medical problem, EMS, to be available on standby until the officers get a chance to check it out. And then they will radio back to dispatch by two-way radio what they have. And finally, to get us involved, the EMS, upon determining that the individual has succumbed, or died in common lay terms, by EKG tracings, they'll ask for 1100, which is our code number for the coroner's office. And then dispatch will contact us. We have a new system that's it's not brand new, but we're just getting it back up and running the way it should be. But they will actually give us a heads up. For example, when that officer calls that in to dispatch, that he has a potential code 500, which is a heart attack, cardiac arrest. They will notify us of the address, the circumstances, if they think it's a a suspected code 500 or overdose or whatever, or a 46, which is an auto accident with injuries. They'll notify us so that, that that heads up will get us prepared mentally for what we're going to encounter. It will also often tell me if I need to be there, if I want to be there. They say we have a multiple multiple injury uh, or potential multiple fatality accident or 1046, then I know I want to go. It just works like that. Then we respond. We get in, get in our vehicle, our, our van, emergency van, radio dispatch that we're en route to that address. Then, of course, when, upon arriving at the scene, we're usually met by EMS personnel and or law enforcement who gives us a uh, synopsis of what the scene is all about. And then we proceed to go in and do, do our job. Hey, you know there's more to the story, so go download the next episode like the true crime fan that you are. The Murder Police Podcast is hosted by Wendy and David Lyons and was created to honor the lives of crime victims so their names are never forgotten. It is produced, recorded, and edited by David Lyons. The Murder Police Podcast can be found on your favorite Apple or Android podcast platform. 
as well as at murderpolicepodcast.com, where you will find show notes, transcripts, information about the presenters, and much, much more. We are also on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, which is closed captioned for those that are hearing impaired. Just search for the Murder Police Podcast and you will find us. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe for more and give us five stars and a written review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcast from. Make sure to subscribe to the Murder Police Podcast and set your player to automatically download new episodes so you get the new ones as soon as they drop. And please tell your friends. Lock it down, Judy. Lock. I found out he had four or five siblings, and one was in Pennsylvania, and one was in Florida. And once we started talking to them, they were beside themselves when they found out about his death. But they also didn't know that he had a daughter who had been placed in foster care. So they came to town immediately. They got in their cars and drove, and we talked on and off the whole trip. And they met the daughter in her foster home. And just recently, this was uh, about this time last year, and they just in the past month got custody of her and she moved with them back to their home. And that was a a happy ending story that seemed like it would never come full circle. The role of coroner with Jessamine County, Kentucky coroner, Michael Hughes, part two of two. Warning, the podcast you're about to listen to may contain graphic descriptions of violent assaults, murder, and adult language. Listener discretion is advised. They say we have a multiple multiple injury uh, or potential multiple fatality accident or 1046, then I know I want to go. It just works like that. Then we respond. We get in, get in our vehicle, our, our van, emergency van, radio dispatch that we're en route to that address. Then, of course, when upon arriving at the scene, we're usually met by EMS personnel and or law enforcement who gives us a uh, synopsis of what the scene is all about. And then we proceed to go in and do, do our job. First thing that we do is look the scene over determine that the decedent truly is dead, not that we doubt uh, EMS, but that's just what we have to do. And then we'll begin by taking a lot a lot of photos, as many as, well, just, just many photos, depending on the type of scene, because you can't have too many if you have a, ever have a court case. That, that's a big part of it. And, and then we have the uh, interviewing of family members and or witnesses as to what happened. Again, the police will continue to fill us in on any paraphernalia, for example, that they might find on the, on the uh, overdose scene, that sort of thing. If there's a weapon, we like, to ex- we like to examine the weapon if we have the opportunity so that we can compare muzzle imprints on the skin if it's a contact wound and that sort of thing to be able to uh, log the serial number type of weapon, caliber of the weapon, and that information. And... Uh, then, once we're finished with all of that, we, what we say bag, it's not a great term, but we bag the patient, the decedent, in, in a body bag and remove them uh, a stretcher to our van. In some cases of natural death, the funeral homes will actually come to the home and uh, secure the body and remove the body. Then we're ready to spend the time that we need to with the family. Uh, suspected overdoses, when we get suspected overdoses, and not even suspected overdoses, even suicides, a car accident that isn't going to go to autopsy, maybe a passenger. When we get to the office, we draw talks ourselves, and then we send it off to our lab that is a lab that the entire state uses. Which consists of what? Blood, urine, and vitreous fluid. 
I was going to ask the same thing because you, you slid the word toxin. <laughs> so we have to talk about what tox is because yeah. some of us know, but not everybody. What toxicology. Is, there we go. Exactly. Fluids for toxicology to run tests to see what's going on in their system. Illicit alcohol answers a lot of questions that we have um, in a lot of, in a lot of cases, really. I feel like you can never be, you can never draw enough tox. I mean, sometimes you can find stuff in tox that you just would never imagine. You know, you, it's, you, it's not a place to assume that you know what's going on. The tox always tells. And sometimes, which, but I know what she's referring to, we could have a 75-year-old person and you think, well, they just natural death. Mm-mm. So it could be overdose. Age has no preference in that. And, uh, of course, the predominance of fentanyl in the illicit drug market has just decimated so many families. Even here in Jessamine County, which we used to like to think we don't have a drug problem, but we all know that every county, every community has a drug problem. But the toxicology labs that we send these to, our spe- these samples to our, our specialists in the way that they use their machines they're able to determine whether it's a, an isomer of a drug or the main drug or whatever kind of drug it is. They get down to the specifics. There are so many different things with fentanyl, butyl fentanyl, oxybutyl fentanyl. There are so many derivatives of drug that they can tell us exactly what, you know, what, what, uh, what they'd taken. So I guess when you get there, if it is an overdose or a suspected, when you arrive, you you may not always know, like Michael said. So I'm assuming if there's a needle there, you assume it's something related to drugs. But I'm just imagining how confusing that may be, kind of like working a puzzle. You get there and you just really don't know, unless it's blatantly obvious, like, you know, a suicide or a car accident. So I guess I'm wondering, where do you all start at square one? Do you just, I can imagine I'd stand there and scratch my head and think, huh? Wonder what happened. Because it may be drugs. It may be a heart attack. You're right. Well, that's why we call it an investigation, because it truly is. One of the things we try to get people out of, and, and it's hard to do, so we, we just we know how to play it in our own minds. But often when we receive that call from dispatch, we'll be told that we have a suicide or we have a drowning or we have such and such. And I always want to add the last line, which I've never, ever done, but I, I want to say, you mean you, we have a drowning because someone was found dead in the water? Okay, that doesn't mean that's a drowning. And, you know, things like that. And it, it's like determining a suicide versus a homicide, or is a suicide an accident, or is it intentional? If it's an accident, it's not suicide, it's an accident. So that's the kind of little game playing you have to do with your own mind and bounce it off a deputy or another coroner or even law enforcement to sit there and talk about. And that's one of the things I liked best about it is when we have something, let's all get together and talk about it here. Let's let's sit down for a minute before you guys sit over there and say, this is clearly a suicide because I always like to play the devil's advocate to a, to a certain extent and say, what if it's not a suicide? And Mike, Michael's really good at that, too. He'll test your brain. Whatever theory you come up with, Michael, fire back with, well, how can you tell me it's not this? I'm like, oh, that's a good question. So but do you all interview the families as well mm-hmm, yeah. to get information? So it's you all and, it's and kind of, law enforcement. Yeah, and it truly is like a puzzle because on certain cases that aren't obvious, and it's somebody that's not, you know, 30 years old, just a middle-aged person, Interviewing the family is huge. Medical records, we'll talk to their doctors, see what's going on. A lot of times their primary care physician will have a diagnosis that we had no idea about, family had no idea about, that answers all the questions. If we can't come up with a definite answer, either the medical examiner will want them to come to autopsy or we'll consult with a medical examiner that'll clarify some things that they think or we'll test theories with the medical examiner and they'll give us advice. Or, you know, They're really approachable and easy to talk to about questions. If that's, we have any, that's one of the <clears throat> excuse me. That's one of the great things that we have about our coroner medical examiner mm-hmm. system, is that approachability going both ways. The medical examiners for our physicians never have I got the feeling that 
um, we're looked down on because we're not physicians, because they don't look at us like that at all. I th they see us as professionals, and they appreciate what we do, as you know, from Greg Davis's interview. I like to, to also believe and, and realize that the differences that we can make sometimes are brought out by their questioning us. And a mm -hmm. lot of times I'll ask my deputies, they'll, they generally will call me if, if I don't go on the call. They'll call me and tell me what they have, what's happened, as Cassie did the, the couple of days ago or last, last night. night. <laughs> last night it was, what we had. And I think I needed, we needed an autopsy. And after she described the case to me, I said, why don't you do one thing for me? Why don't you call the medical examiner and talk to him about it? Because I like them to be familiar and them being the deputies to be familiar and comfortable with uh, having a rapport to discuss a case with, with the uh, medical examiner. And often they will ask questions that maybe we didn't think about on a case. Or they'll say, is this a possibility or is that a possibility? Or what do you think about this or that? And sometimes there's no surprises. They no, just don't think you need one as far as we can see. But if you want one, we'll do it. That's, 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 that's the way right. they handle it. Yeah. They'll, even if they're like, well, I think you're good. You know, I think this is a solid answer. But if you would be more comfortable bringing the decedent, we'll take a look at him just to confirm, you know, your thoughts. I, so wanted, you to, I wanted to, excuse me, I just wanted to, th I just wanted to throw in, Olivia is not a medically trained individual, but she has a lot of medical experience. Now, she, she, I should take that back, shouldn't I? You're a medical legal death investigator, aren't you? I'm sorry, I forgot about that. Yes, yes I got are. my training through St. Saint, Saint Louis University. I took both the master's, the basic and the master's course in medical legal death investigating. But I do have a lot, a lot of medical training. I had the a privilege of shadowing a internal medicine physician who sees about 60 patients a day over like a 12-year period uh, learning the medical terminology. I think it was it about meant. 19 years, if I'm not mistaken, 12. Uh, which I gained so much knowledge just shadowing a young internal medicine physician uh, who specialized in cardiology. I was able to chart things for him, um, look at the chart and get the vitals and get the charts ready for the next day of the patients that he was going to see. And I just gained a wealth of knowledge as far as the medical field. My degree, my bachelor's degree and my master's degree is both in accounting, finance, management and marketing. So that's where I came out of college. And then right out of college, I had this privilege of working with a medical uh, doctor, shadowing him. Well, I wanted to bring that up just because even though she's not a, an official deputy coroner, she's been pretty, pretty uh, helpful in even asking me, and occasionally the deputies, we, we all talk. We, we talk like a family in the office and about cases, okay? We have uh, confidentiality agreements and arrangements. We don't talk about those kind of things outside. But uh, she often has great ideas for us. Did you look at this? Did you think about this? What if this happened or what if that happened? And she knows our routine so well. We're almost joined at the hip for her being with me so much of the time. She's a vital part of what we do. She's not just a telephone answer and paper shuffler at all. She works, makes schedules for the for the deputies and assists me. Well, maybe I assist her. I'm not sure. Of course, one of my roles as as the coroner is to fill out death certificates and to sign them. And for every cremation that, that occurs in the county, I have to approve it and sign it. I mean, we work closely with the funeral homes. And they're the ones that send me the provisional or have me sign a provisional report of death, just stating that I'm okay with them cremating, that there's nothing being hidden or whatever. So therefore, I have a responsibility to know a little bit about every case, every human being that's cremated in the county of Jessamine. I never knew any of that. So th that's fascinating. I, I never knew that, that the coroner signed off on those. And again, what's the, what's the reason again? Is that to, to make sure we don't destroy evidence that 
Well, I, I think the reason is is several fold. One is to satisfy the legal requirement. Two is to satisfy anything that, that a family member may have to say about a dispute in whether that was really their relative or was it who was supposed to be. Thirdly, to make sure we have proper authorization from the family to cremate. And the only time we don't need that is when we don't have a family to refer them to, or in a case we've had recently, where we can't get the majority of family members to authorize their cremation for whatever reason. There's no cost to them to do that, but some people just don't, either because of uh, poor family dynamics or whatever. They Some people just say, I don't want to sign. So if you have five members of five children, let's say, three of the five have to sign. If you have two, both have to sign. And that's just the just law. If that happens, we can't cremate somebody. All we can do is bury them, even an indigent individual who has no family that will claim them or will help with burial expenses. Now, that burial expense is not, does not come to us, and it's not us that makes that decision. That comes from the county judge executive. I never knew any of that. I didn't either. And I also, Cassie and us talking the other day, you mentioned attending autopsies. I didn't know that you all attended those. Yeah. Yeah. And that's another way that we've really gotten to know the medical examiners. And it, it, they're so approachable because they'll just hands on. I remember my very first autopsy. She, I, I, I don't remember exactly who, who it was, but she said, come here. But, you know, just come check it out, get closer. And, and you really do learn uh, seeing it firsthand, especially when you're invested in a case. You want to, you're really curious what was the cause of death. And I feel like I've learned a lot from attending autopsies from my cases. She means, when, she means when it's one of our cases, because, you know, you get down there and they could be doing any other county's autopsy, but it's really important when it's ours. Yeah. You're, you're a little more invested in it. When we go to our basic training, our 40 hour course. There's a whole day in Louisville at the Louisville's med- medical examiner's office. I couldn't count how many autopsies we watched in a day, just seeing from every range of, of cause of manner of death. I think that's really good experience seeing it from the inside out. I wanted to mention in Kentucky, we have one chief medical examiner, and then we have a staff medical examiners under him. Oh, I say him now. And we have, what is it, five five. Autopsy centers is is Madisonville still open? I can't remember. So it's either four or five that are located throughout the state. Our ours is typically Frankfurt, Uh, and when we have the adequate staffing, meaning autopsy techs and medical examiners, then Frankfurt's open. When we don't have enough people, they'll close like sort of like every other week. And if we have something, we have to transport to Louisville. But that's the way that system works. They'll tell us when it's scheduled. And if we want to attend, such as homicides, we typically attend those. And um, they'll notify us when they're going to do it. And often a a detective from the police department will will go with us or um, sheriff's deputy. And, you know, we just go down and observe the process learn firsthand exactly what what they found and how they found. So you all do that, the transportation as well to that facility. Mm -hmm. To to the autopsy. And then typically the funeral home will pick up from the medical examiner's office. And that's important because there's a chain of custody issue. Mm -hmm. And you are the ideal people for that too. I understand you learn from it too, but it was my experience that the medical examiner needs the people that were at the scene. That's there. such a good point. They, there's, they have to. Yeah. Great point. Because yeah. they're coming from a point, they're just getting bullet points of a story. So they'll come across a bruise or a laceration. And I might have just a very obvious answer that would not be obvious to them if they didn't see the scene. So they really do like when we're there to answer questions that they wouldn't expect to come up just about things. Yeah, anything, lifestyle, victim, victimology, Absolutely. risk yeah. factors, things like that, things going on in the family, things that the family have said. It, because they're a blank slate with that decedent, too. I mean, they mm-hmm. can do the technical aspects, but 
I was listening to that, and I thought, yeah, you're learning and they're learning, too. They they have to have that input from people that were on the ground because one or two observations from you could mm-hmm. skew them in a completely different direction and, and examine that body in a different way. And Michael mentioned taking photos earlier, and I had a case earlier this year where I actually went through my scene photos with the medical examiner, and there were parts of the photos that it would explain certain injuries to the decedent that without those pictures – you know, you're kind of trying to describe a scene and that's, it's, that can be difficult without seeing it in a, in a photo. It's like anything else between the photos and the talks and everything. It's all about getting everything you can get when you can get it at the, at the right time. The earlier, the better, mm-hmm. you know, especially with toxicology and things mm-hmm. like that. Me and Michael were talking on the way into the room to interview is your best shot at any of this is the first time around. And Greg Davis said that, that the first autopsy really is the only autopsy. Yeah, there's obviously no second chances on a lot of this. Just the same as the position that the person is found in. Once they're moved, even EMS doesn't generally move the individual if they're lying, excuse me, if they're lying prone or they're face down. And EMS's rules are I guess their guidelines, the way they, they function is that they have to uh, ascertain death or a lack of life by placing the electrodes on and get a flat line. And they can do that on the back as well as on the front. So we've helpfully tried when we could to direct them in that direction to not try to roll the person over. Sometimes Police departments get overzealous and they want to hurry up and roll the person over to try to find the weapon if they think that it's a suicide. And I try to say, well, it's not going to go anywhere. It'll still be there when I'm ready to roll them if you don't mind waiting. Like I said, some people have pretty good experience with coroner's work and, and some don't. Well, I did want to ask both of you, Cassie and Michael, do you all have cases that just really stand out that are hard not saying all of them are hard to forget, or, but I'm sure some stand out more so than others. I have a bunch. I get I get attached to the families I work with, and I think about them all the time. And it ranges from I had a cl- a, a case it was a man in his upper 90s that passed drinking his coffee, eating a sausage biscuit, and we see a lot of tragic stuff. But something about that case, he was. All of his family was there. He lived a full, happy life. And I was more emotional, I feel like, on that case than some of my more tragic ones. That one sticks out a lot. Like, we all hope to have a, live a full, long life and pass peacefully in that way. But most recently, I had a, a case in Wilmore where a man passed. His daughter was in foster care, and we couldn't locate next of kin. Uh, Michael and I tried for three, three or so days to find next of kin. and. Neighbors didn't really know. He had told people that he didn't have any family. And I think the last day we had um, just a shot in the dark. I had a lead in Florida and sent a sheriff in Florida to a home to see if this was possibly his mother. And it ended up being his mother. I found out he had four or five siblings and one was in Pennsylvania and one was in Florida. And once we started talking to them, they were beside themselves when they found out about his death. But they also didn't know that he had a daughter who had been placed in foster care. So they came to town immediately. They got in their cars and drove, and we talked on and off the whole trip. And they met the daughter in her foster home. And just recently, this was uh, about this time last year, and they just in the past month got custody of her, and she moved to with them back back home to their home. And that was a, a happy ending story that seemed like it would never come full circle. I was worried about this girl in foster care with no family when I, we knew there was family out there. So that was a, that was a good a good ending. And I think about that family a lot. I get updates all the time, and I love to hear them, how it's all worked out for the better. But I could go on. I could talk for hours about different cases and families that we've, we've dealt with and still talk to. I was pretty impressed with Cassie's work and her devotion to what she does. This girl had written something, to, a nice letter to Cassie that she shared with us that Cassie apparently had talked to her most of the way or maybe even all the way on, on the, her trip from, was it Pennsylvania? Mm-hmm. To Kentucky. Uh, she was frightened. She was upset, very emotional. And Cassie kind of talked her down and talked her in and spent that kind of extra time with her on her own 
to make the girl comfortable with the whole situation. I, I thought that was pretty good. Yeah, that's Kathy. She just goes above and beyond whatever's required in the office. I like to make to-do lists on that. But not only are you dealing with overwhelming grief of the loss that just happened and that causes you to be frantic, then the other part of your brain is thinking, well, then what do I do next? What do I do about this? And what do I do about this? And so we kind of, with all my families, I like to just start, like, we're just going to start here. We're going to accomplish this and then we'll move on to the next thing. And that's actually what she and I talked about majority of her drive there. Well, we're going to start with this and then we'll, then we'll call the landlord and then we'll call the foster parents. And so that kind of works us through the chaos of it all. But because of her insistence there, or persistence, excuse me, she was able to reunite a family. She actually brought this girl back into the folds of the family. It was, for all intent purposes, totally split. I don't think there was really any connection. Yeah, they didn't know that she existed. Did, they, they, did they end up adopting that girl? They're in the process right now of adoption. I think mm -hmm. that's amazing for something that wasn't a part of her job to do that. What about you, Michael? Do you have any that really stands out that have you, because you've done this for many years, so I know you've seen many things. Are there any that just stand out and grab you? Yeah, there, there are. Grab me in different ways, I guess, is the situation, because as Cassie's talking, even though I know the situation somewhat, my mind was kind of reeling in, gee, the, the happy moments, the terribly sad moments the nothing but despair moments, the extreme loss moments. Of course, everybody, that whether they lose one family member or five or six, it's a tragedy. It's usually the most difficult day of that person's life up to that time. And I think just by realizing that we get to be a part of that, not that we have to be a part of it, we don't have to do this, but we get to do it to try to be a comfort and somewhat of a blessing for these people. And that's why we feel like God uses us in this capacity. That's the devotion that we have. One that sticks out is where uh, five family members, five members from the same family, and one that wasn't a member of that family uh, perished in a horrific, fiery crash on, on 27. And that was a pretty difficult one to get through. For, for various reasons that I really don't want to go into in a deep way, but based on the conditions and the severity of the, of the injuries and, and that sort of thing, it just really will always live with me to some extent. One that co sort of caused me to tear up a little bit was just simply a, an older gentleman who was sitting in his rocker still with a half-eaten, half gallon of ice cream and a spoon in his hand with the ice cream in his lap. And I thought, wow, what a way to go, enjoying your favorite ice cream. But yet there was a poignant sorrow to it, if you know what I mean. It's like, gee, didn't get to enjoy the whole thing, you know. I, I'm not really sh sure that it was humorous at the time. It, it wasn't, but it's just this, the different ways that you see these things. The shock factors that I've had from people who have jumped, people who have drowned, people who have fallen, people who have taken their own lives, and the heartbroken, grief-filled parents who don't understand and can't understand that they thought that he had kicked the habit and was finally, finally graduated from his rehab and headed for Florida for a brand new teaching job and still had his U-Haul loaded up, or connected to his car and all the furniture still in it when they found him, his first, which was supposed to be his first day on the brand new job. Just a grief that the family has to go through, you know. Uh, that's why we try to play an active role. I'm involved with the health department in our ASAP program, which is Agency Against Sub uh, Substance Abuse Policy. We try all the educational maneuvers we can think of, and they're never quite good enough, or they're just, they don't go quite far enough. The suicides that we see that are totally meaningless, or totally unnecessary, no suicides necessary, I, I don't believe, but some of them just seem to be for the most, you know, a girlfriend breaks up with a boy, and he shoots himself 
or have had one girl break uh, shoot herself for the very same reason. I don't know. Cassie, how many suicides have we had this year already? Eight or ten, I'm sure. A lot. It's been uh, a record year on many and, levels. And it's still just April. Mm-hmm. And n- not all, but a fair percentage are young people. And that's heartbreaking. Every single one of those is heartbreaking. Yeah, they're they're memorable. And they say that these things never leave you. And I've always felt sort of immune from that, for the most part. But I've had a couple that were pretty rough on me, particularly the cases that I work. We all share in that grief sometime. We all sit around and we'll talk about the case, which is a good therapy for us uh, within our department to discuss some of the cases that we, that we take care of. And it's interesting to me when people say, what do you have to do to get to be a coroner? And I say, oh, if you have enough time, I'd like to explain that to you sometime because it's not so much what you have to do to get there. It's what you have to be able to do to stay there. It's the way I feel about it. Some people say, I I can't do that. I couldn't do this or that. Maybe maybe they can't. I always felt like anybody could do anything they wanted to do. If their heart's in the right place. Yeah, that's true. And I think me personally, I see it from a a sort of a mother hen perspective. I get really protective over my families. Like once I get on scene, I understand that the death part of it is tragic and it's horrible and it affects me too. But in that process, I don't know if I'm distracted by or to not dwell on it. I just want to take care of my families. I shared something on Facebook the other day and it ended with a quote that said, I'm here. Those are some of the holiest words I've ever heard. And that's so true because it's such a lonely, scary, dark time. And a lot of people don't have anybody that's gone through it before with them. And just to be able to say, and again, I don't share it often about my loss, but every once in a while, Somebody just might need to hear that to know, oh, well, you are surviving and it's okay. And uh, that, that kind of keeps you going with it, I believe. But at the, but at the same time, I, I think that one of the strangest things that people can say is it'll be okay. People don't know it's going to be okay. People don't know what, what, what is okay. Mm-hmm. Going through suffering with something every day because it never goes away. As some of our professional friends have told us, even Dr. Greg Davis said, we say that, how is it? it it'll, it'll get better, or it'll pass away, or it just takes time, but you never get over it. But, you know, it's, it's, it, it may get better, mm-hmm. but you never get over it. And I'm, I'm speaking primarily for the families. I think it'll, those things will last less with us as yeah. coroners. Yeah. But for the families, we can see. Just how difficult it is. I, I know Olivia and Cassie, too, have talked to numerous people about the sufferings and what goes on in their lives after they've lost their loved ones. We still get calls occasionally from people who have passed, uh, their family members have passed three years ago, four years ago, maybe even beyond that. She'll still get a call and they just want to say hi, just thinking about you and want to thank you again or whatever the case might be. Let you know that it doesn't doesn't go away. And I think it's healthy to approach it that way too. Obviously not on a scene, but in the weeks and months after a death and I'm working with the family, I feel comfortable enough to be like, this really is going to suck. You know, this, it, this is going to hurt and you're going to feel it. And let's just feel it and let's be sad for now. Because I think Michael's right when people say it's going to be okay, this will pass, they're in a better place. You know, but I think dealing with the reality of it and just being really honest is oddly comforting to some, like, oh, this is normal that I feel hopeless and that this hurts like it does. And like, yeah, absolutely. And we're going to feel it. And I'm here if you need me. Call me. I'm here. And it does, it doesn't get better. But like Michael said, it, you, you just start to process it and learn to live with it. I hate for somebody to do that alone. So we're there. I think when Michael asked me to be a volunteer in the coroner's office, I quickly stepped up to the role because I had lost my dad um, to cancer um, very quickly, um, very unexpectedly. And um, 
I still feel that pain today, and it doesn't go away, and I still pick up the phone almost every morning to place that call to my dad to ask a question, and, and I realize he's not there. So I guess my role in, in the biggest role in the coroner's office, as I see it, is being with those families, talking to those families, writing them a sympathy note, just writing them a note when their child's birthday is, or sending that mother a Mother's Day card that lost that infant. It helps me to heal in what I went through um, with my, my own father passing. That's the biggest blessing I get out of it. And I thank God every day that I am where I am. Truly, it's a, it's a calling there, too, and to be able to take that tragedy and that loss and, and again, turn it into something that's going to help other people is phenomenal. Well, one thing I just want to add, the last thing I have to say, unless you have other questions, somebody asked me what advice would I give to people uh, that cross my path in, in everyday life. And I've, I thought about that for a while, and I thought of all the experiences I've had, why people die, why they have to die, well, we all know that. It's usually human error. My thoughts on that are be careful, don't take unnecessary risks, don't be distracted, Run from drugs. Make sure your family knows how much you love them. That sums up a whole lot of loss right there that would be prevented. And, you know, it sounds simple, but it's, actually, it's, it's extremely true. Extremely true. Well, I do have to ask. I know that the election's coming up. I've been seeing your signs everywhere and on vehicles. And why don't you tell us when that's coming and what, what you hope to expect out of that? Well, I hope to expect victory. On the serious side, that, that will be May 17th, which is the primary for our county, I think statewide as well, because it's nonpartisan for our race as well as the sheriff. We will not have a general election. So the, the big deal for our election process is this primary. So... If you don't vote in this primary, you won't get to vote in the general. As far as the, these two races go, the sheriff and, and the coroner, very expectant and hopeful for the support of all those people who have steadfastly voted for me for the past three terms. And I hope that I've served the community well and that uh, there are no real issues. There's always small issues, always small things that might turn into a disagreement or whatever. But I hope by and large we've been able to satisfy people with the way that we handled the compassion and the dignity part of our, of our role in dealing with the loss of loved ones and their families. We don't rush our investigations or our relationships with the families. We try to be there as much as necessary. We actually tell each family that they can reach not only the deputy that may have taken care of them, but myself or Olivia almost 24 hours a day. We like to turn our primary phones off at about 11 o'clock at night. But, you know, seven days a week we're available if you have questions or comments or you just want us to come and visit you, we're there. We're there for you, and that's why we're doing the job we're doing. Please please elect us and keep us in there for four more years. You know, Michael, I like how you termed it, elect us. And, and when I think of you all, I think of you all as a team, as a group, all of your people, because often as I tell my staff, we actually just had a staff meeting last night, I'm only as strong as my weakest staff member that I have. And I said to them, I can't do this without you all. And I feel quite confident you feel the same about Olivia and Cassie and your other deputies. I mean, everybody knows that you're, you're great, and that's why we have you, you know, for as many terms as we've had you, and we hope to get you more. But I think you would probably agree, without that team, without your us, Michael Hughes' corner is not, you're only as strong as you could be without them, right? Absolutely. I couldn't have said it better, and obviously I didn't, but... Uh, <laughs> but. You're, you're absolutely right. I just feel, I feel a sense of pride with the deputies that, for the job that they do, for the dedication they have. I won't personally tolerate any insults or 
bad comments or reviews about them because I know the kind of people that they are. And I know that there are always going to be people who are never satisfied or looking for something to complain about. We haven't had much of that, hardly even recognizable. And we're so thankful that people recognize how dedicated my deputies are. You're right. They, they make me who I am now. Yeah, that's right. And I think they've evolved to who they are, you know, from listening to what Cassie's telling us and Olivia's telling us because of you. Cassie has evolved into this role, which she didn't do for a living as you've done. And she does it with grace and dignity. And, and I mean, she's just exceptional. And I, I have to toot her horn. I don't know the other lady that we've talked about or your other deputies, but from my personal experience, you know, I just didn't even know that a coroner's office could take that kind of compassion and reach out to somebody and, you know, and, and just stay on the phone and, and bless her heart. She was, when we were talking on Friday, she was saying her son was calling her and I'm like, oh no, you're a mom. You have to do that first as a mom. I know. And she's like, I can call you back. And I'm like, no, cause I'll keep you on the phone till 4 a.m. It's already 1 a.m. And she said, but that's okay. <laughs> and, and, and she never even said, yeah, I'm tired. That's a great idea. Let's talk a different time. And, you know, I would like to ask Cassie and Olivia, why don't you tell our listeners, I know from personal experience, but why don't you tell our listeners why you all think that our community should keep Michael in office? Well, from my perspective as a wife and part of his team as a volunteer, Obviously, I think Michael is the best candidate because he feels like that this job is really not a job. It's his privilege to get to serve the citizens of Jessamine County. He shows so much compassion to these families and gives so much dignity to the decedents that he is the best choice because he has had going on 12 years of coroner's experience. He has 45 years in medical experience and training. He has investigated with his deputies over 1,100 cases since 2011. He has many numerous continuing education through the Department of Criminal Justice training, as well as his basic and master's graduation from the St. Louis University. And I just really think like he is the most experienced candidate that I would want someone to deal with if I had a loss in my family. Absolutely. Cassie, Cassie, what do you have to say about it? I have a, I have a lot to say about it. Uh, I, I, I agree. Michael is one of the most compassionate, other than my own father, one of the most compassionate men that I've ever met, which is refreshing to see a, a, a man that'll walk in and ask to give a family a hug or shed a tear with the family with no hesitation whatsoever. The other part that I love about Michael is he's brilliant when it comes to the workings of a case, the causes, the medical background, and the patience that he has to share that brilliance with his deputies or even families just explaining. We're all really good at the compassion part and the big heart part because that's a huge priority for us. But the background of it too is a lot of these families really want to know what happened. And Michael's really thorough. He doesn't leave any stone unturned when it comes to determining cause and manner of a death. And even if it's something just as simple as a natural, something almost expected, he still will take the time to explain it and investigate it just so the family feels at peace that all questions can be answered because he's taken the time to figure it out. And he shares that with us, that patience and that knowledge and how to get from point A to point B to get everybody answers. So I guess you'd say it's just the whole package. <laughs> he does it. He does it all. And it's been a pleasure to learn and to be a part of this office, it's almost like a big family. I, Stephanie and Paul and Michael Olivia and I, I would be, I don't know what I'd do without them. <laughs> They're all my phone calls every day. Well, other than you, Wendy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and a couple other people, my son and my husband. But uh, no, I call Michael and Olivia. They're, they're almost one of my very first phone calls every morning. Well, I want to correct you. We're not almost a family. We We're, are. We are a family. <laughs> we really, the amount of time that we spend together. And I don't think I've been just, I'm just going to add this too. When you said that about being tired, I'm pretty sure I've not been asleep yet since last night. So I'm getting good at this no sleep. (laughs) I keep getting caught up in my words. Sorry, go ahead. Well, and again, you know, it goes to show your all's level of dedication. You came in here, bless your heart. You, and you know, we were supposed to record this a week ago and 
Cassie was so tired, but she said, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. And I said, no, please, <laughs> please go to sleep. We'll do it another day. It is really okay. But I, I just hope that our citizens of our community that's listening to this can hear a little snippet of the dedication of this team that we have in the way that they're willing to serve our community and reach out, not just in those times of need, but it goes beyond that, as Olivia said, with cards and phone calls, and it just doesn't stop during that tragic event. This coroner team doesn't forget each and every one of these cases, and they they make an effort to keep reaching out because I, if anybody's had the unfor- misfortune of, of losing someone, and I know everyone has one way or another, that grief just doesn't go away. You just don't get over it. You just don't forget about it. You live that. So for this team to reach out to people and let them know I'm thinking of you or, hey, I remember that horrible day. I'm thinking of you during this time. That says so much. And and when May 17 rolls around, I want the people of our community to stand up with me and David and be proud to, to reelect Michael and his team into this office because they've served us so well for the past 12 years. Well, I just, I'd like to say that uh, I'd like to extend my thanks to both of you for having us and putting us on this podcast and sharing with us and letting us share with you so many of our experiences and what we go through in in a day. And uh, I hope you can see that we are very cohesive. It's really, it really is just a pleasure to not be in a situation where you have to work with people you don't like for whatever reason or people who don't like you. You can really feel a part of our office when you're in our office. We try to even share that with other offices that we relate with, whether it's police or EMS or fire or whoever. We try to share with them where we come from. Olivia is known for baking cookies uh, for for not only our office, but actually for a lot of the decedent's families. Can I interrupt really quick with that? I knew about Olivia's cookies before I met Olivia. This was years (laughs) and years ago. How did we not get the cookies brought out here? Oh, they're they're coming. I I can guarantee you. We said it now. I'd say that was eight years ago. I had Olivia's cookies and I thought, I've got to meet this woman. You you got to taste it. Olivia, your cookies must really be good. Well, I started out baking them when we went to the fu- funerals of our decedent's families uh, because I thought, what kind of gift can I give back that's a personal touch, that's not just flowers that everybody sends? And I thought, well, baking my homemade cookies shows a per- more personal touch. And that's kind of how I got it started with my cookies. And then I started sending them to dispatch and EMS and to the Commonwealth Attorney's Office, the attorney, uh, County Attorney's Office, and it just spread from there. Everywhere I went, I was like, I've got to bake them cookies. And now everybody's come to expect them. Absolutely. Well, good deal. I just wanted to thank you all, too. Our listeners on the podcast, are they listen a lot to learn. It's more than a story being told, and we're proud to have you all, and we're really fortunate to get the opportunity to sit down. And I believe that the listeners will now feel what it's like to work in that environment because, again, TV and Hollywood really doesn't portray anything of what you do accurately at all. And to especially the the resonance on your personal lives and the dedication you have, I I think they're going to enjoy listening to that. So thank you all for opening your your hearts and your your experiences to the people that listen to this podcast. I think all of them, and just like me and Wendy, are grateful. Well, once again, we're we're grateful to you all. I thank you for that kind comment, and I hope someday I can do something else that's interesting and come back and talk with you all again. Absolutely. Well, we'd certainly love to have you. Thank you all so much, Michael, Olivia, Cassie. Thank you so much for coming, taking your evening. Cassie, I know you're so sleepy. I'll give you a pillow and a blanket in a moment. But thank you all so much. And listeners, please, 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 it's so important that you get out on May 17th and keep these people in our community. The Murder Police Podcast is hosted by Wendy and David Lyons and was created to honor the lives of crime victims so their names are never forgotten. It is produced, recorded, and edited by David Lyons. The Murder Police Podcast can be found on your favorite Apple or Android podcast platform as well as at MurderPolicePodcast.com. 
where you will find show notes, transcripts, information about the presenters, and much, much more. We are also on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, which is closed captioned for those that are hearing impaired. Just search for the Murder Police Podcast and you will find us. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe for more and give us five stars and a written review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcast from. Make sure to subscribe to the Murder Police Podcast and set your player to automatically download new episodes so you get the new ones as soon as they drop. And please tell your friends. Lock it down, Judy.